Are we ready? We're on? We are on. Okay. Well, good morning. My name is C. Akira Leitao, and I am in the group with uh, Robert uh, Groves. And um, hey, good morning. I'm Robert Groves. <laughs> <laughs> so we are doing the video um, to kind of talk about the uh, recorded assignment. Um, there was three in the group, but uh, sad we lost one. But I and Robert are going to try to make the best of it. Do you want to go first or you want me to go first? I'm sure I can go first. Okay. The, the theory I'm going to talk about is from Laura Polk. She first came up with this theory on resiliency. She designed the theory when she was a graduate student at Catholic University in Washington, D.C which I thought was probably very interesting that a student, a doctorate student, actually yeah. came up with a theory concept. But she designed it because she was tired of reading about, and it was in 1998, she designed it because she was tired of reading about theories about distress, mm -hmm. which has kind of a negative connotation to them. And she thought resiliency was a very positive way to look at how people recover from illnesses and how nurses go about doing their job as well. So she, she had two, two parts to her concepts. So she looked at what makes, what, why do some patients recover easier and faster than others do? And she found that there were some intrinsic traits in those folks that uh, allow them to cope with especially terminal illness and chronic illnesses. And uh, strength of character was one but also having a good support system, either through, through community resources mm -hmm. or through family support with, with another. It was common to all of those folks who had some type of uh, resiliency recovery. With nurses, she found that peer support, if you, have, if you work in an environment that has good peer support, then, then you are more likely to cope with your, with your job easier. Also a supportive supervisor, which I think goes back to that transformational leadership theory that we've talked about in mm -hmm. special groups this week, as well as a supportive family and a social network for doing things outside of work. She found that nurses who have nothing but work usually have trouble coping with the stresses of work and, or, or and feel stressed quite frequently, even to the point of more frequent illnesses and more frequently missed days at work. So that was her theory of resiliency. Okay, that's that's pretty good. I, um, who did you say it was again? I'm sorry. Laura Polk, P-O-L-K, P-O-L-K. Oh, that's interesting, because yeah, um, we as nurses, we do have a lot of stress at work. And one of the, I think, I also wrote on like the kind of stress a little bit on the um, behavior, is it the behavior or the social um, social theory, but um, some stress I do agree um, that some stress is good because it kind of keeps you um, on your toes, but that's very interesting that um, she tried to, she, she said that nurses that only know work um, uh, more liable to be more stressed at work. That's interesting. I have to use that at work. <laughs> that would be a great morale builder, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, uh, I don't know how they're gonna they're gonna tolerate it or not. But my theory is I chose to write on a fees malaise. Um, so her theory is pretty much. Um, Oh, I have to open up my paper. I should have been more prepared. But anyway, um, she, um, she, hers also started as um, she was doing her PhD, and it was more because of um, her work with her colleagues and because she was also a teacher. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was uh, the fact that her mother was also um, a nurse, and she was one of the first um, to get, like, a PhD um, so I thought that was interesting because a lot of us go into nursing because of like family and all that. But um, the first she tried to, what she tried to do was look at um, like pregnant women and uh, how they, how the pregnant women cope 
how their mm-hmm. husbands also um, uh, think of like, okay, did they do family planning? Um, uh, what was the outcome of it? Unfortunately for her, she, um, the outcome uh, was that um, it she didn't ha- it, it wasn't resolved. She couldn't really use that theory, so she decided to try people that actually have something against them. Um, I think it comes mo- it, it goes in hand in hand with like um, care coordination. That people that have um, that if you start planning ahead when the patients first get to the hospital. If you start planning their care ahead of time, like people that might need like home health, um, they tend to fare better or people that have like go to like rehab, if they know ahead of time, if the family is better in, um, informed about what is going on in the health of the, uh, of the patient, um, their be- uh, the, the turnout for their health is a lot better than families that have no clue what's going on with their family or um, family that are not even involved in the care of their loved ones, all of a sudden they have to take their loved ones home. So um, I kind of, I liked hers and I used the trend, like I told you yesterday, I have a very um, good manager when it comes to like saying the transformational, uh, transformational leadership. She's actually pretty good. She comes on the floor. Um, she never wears regular clothes to work, which is good. <laughs> She's always uh, scrub ready to wear. If we need her to come on the floor, she'll come on the floor and work as a, as a, regular, uh, as a regular nurse and she never complains about it. That's why in one of my papers I said, um, if your leader, if you don't find your leader in the corner complaining about work, you ha- there'll be no way for you to sit in the corner to um, to complain about work. And she does a lot of the care coordination for the patients. She tries to do like when they first get there, what is the plan? She talks to the doctors like, cause we work on oncology unit. She talks about like, what is the plan for the patient? How is the patient gonna succeed? Um, how is the patient not gonna come back? Cause you know, they do pay. The hospital is responsible if they come back in like uh, less than 30 days, the hospital. So a fees, um, theory kind of works in that way to like reduce the amount of um reduce the uh the time the like shortage of time not reduce the shortage of time but prevent the patient from coming back if you start early planning the patient's care there's no way the patient will uh, backslide or have to return to the hospital early does your unit do like weekly care conferences on your patients Oh, we do daily. <laughs> we do Monday. We'll say Monday through Friday. We do because we are not trying to, because especially like the oncology patients, it's kind of different for them. But because we also have med surge patients, uh, not that we don't like med surge uh, patients, but we don't want them to come back to the unit. So we do care coordination to try to see like, what is the doctor's plan? What do they have going on? What kind of plan? Or care are they going to need when they leave the hospital to where they're not going to come back? Yeah, when I was in the nursery, we did weekly uh, care conferences on our long term patients. Yeah. They were interdisciplinary, so you had physical therapy, yeah. social work, speech therapy. Yeah. Uh, all, ty- all types of specialties there, and, and, and their families were always invited to come too. And those patients did much better after discharge. Oh yeah, planning than than those whose families and 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 would not participate. Oh yeah, you could you could kind of you could kind of see like the family dynamics when the when the patient comes and they like the more family that come to see them, it doesn't matter how long they've been in the hospital. The more family involvement they have, the better they are. Um, I worked in a nursing home, and I always tell people the patients that have family come see them farewell regardless of how long they're gonna be in the nursing home they farewell i mean they don't have like the sign of stress or like uh depression from nobody coming to see them so i i do um i i can resonate with her theory um when it comes to my department because we do consider what's the long-term need of the patient versus um can we just treat them now and get them out the door Going back to transformational leadership, I have a manager that that is much like your manager. Oh wow! She comes, she comes dressed in her her scrubs too, in case she has to come help out on the. Out on the- <laughs> uh, but you know, we I, I looked and I posted this in my discussion 
to one of our peers' responses last night about does a transformational leadership handle chaos better than than, than a transactional manager would? And I, I think they do because obviously chaos is around us every day. There's oh yeah, predictable about every clinical day. That is definitely true. <laughs> you never know who's going to walk through those doors. <laughs> That's definitely and, true. And I find that I, I had both transactional and transformational managers, and I, the transformational leader does handle chaos better because they draw up on the strengths of all of their people, I think, to, to manage yeah. the chaos. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. And those those are the type of people, because uh, I will say, because one of the traits of a trans, uh, uh, transitional leader is being able to influence people and she does she definitely does it's not a matter of like what she says but her action she doesn't have to say anything it's the action that pe uh, encourages people to do a lot because um right now we're really really short so sometimes like i mentioned she'll come in the weekend um people will pick up shifts just so she doesn't have to work because we know if we do really need her she'll um She'll definitely pick up. So I think those those are the kind of leaders we actually need in nursing, not the ones that think just because I'm a manager now, come in like regular clothes when the floor is short. If staffing can't supply, because we use staffing, and if staffing can't supply people, then you're pretty much going to work seven to eight. Our manager, if we have to work greater than six, she'll come. She'll definitely come in. Cause she doesn't even the six she doesn't really want us to work six but because the hospital is so short they pull nurses from different departments and if you have seven or eight they're pretty much pulling two because for staffing six is um like five we have 36 beds so they figure like six um six is enough eight is overdoing it so they'll pull two but um it's it's interesting it's interesting. Theory is not really my, my favorite thing. <laughs> so, you know, we may need to look for a theory before this class is over that supports your staffing because everywhere I've ever worked, staff, there was no scientific method to staffing. It was a gut feeling. Yeah. Even if they had like acuity ratings where you, you know, came up, tried to come up with an acuity rating on your patients, it was still, well, you have eight here, but this place up this unit only has four. And yeah. So you can't leave eight here and leave four there, even if your acuity calls for eight. Yeah, that 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 is definitely something you fight with every. Cause I'm um I'm the unit coordinator, so every time I work, I have to be the charge nurse, and it's hard. Cause they um uh, we we had the ability to say we don't we're not taking any more patients, but now the hospital has taken that away to where. Um, bed tower assigns you people and it's your responsibility to kind of look and say hey no I remember um, I had to call my manager in an instant where they were gonna send me a patient that the blood pressure was like um, pretty much she had low blood pressure the whole time she was in the hospital and she, she had been in Transdellenburg position all day and I'm an oncology med surgeon oncology floor they were gonna send me that patient I was like what do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do with this patient? You're going to send them and I'm just going to call an MRT and send her right back. So um, um, it's, it, it'll be interesting to, um, to see. Uh, it's, 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 what do you work? You, do you do patient care still? Yeah, I do patient yeah. care. That, uh, I coordinate care for a, a panel of 1500 patients. Oh, wow. So, oh wow! All veterans, half about half of them with chronic illnesses. Yeah. And then other, and then ha about half of them with with uh, not chronic illnesses, but r remnants of battle battlefield. Oh, injuries. like PTSD. PTSD, kind of? or you know, learning to cope with an amputated limb. Oh, or, gotcha. You know, or you know, some alteration in their body function from from. A bowel injury. Oh, oh wow! So we we just integrated. We just recently integrated a mental health uh, psychologist into our primary care clinic to help with some of that. So she's been huh. a big resource, and we also have added a third clinical pharmacist 
that that specializes in mental health medication so that she can actually when they come in for appointments she can actually assess whether their medications are working the way that the uh they should had, had plans for it to be so going into our theory how stressful would you say your job is if you had to relate your uh the stress at work because you know one of the is this uh behavioral is it behavioral um no, is the one that has to do with like the chaos and like the stress how would you say stress is for your job for me personally on a scale of zero to ten with ten being most stressful and zero being no stress about three yeah. or four about three or four i'm a pretty low-key person so it takes a lot to get me excited yeah <laughs> I have found um, I have found through my years of experience if you remain calm and focused on the task at hand. Yeah. Like the patient yesterday with subdural hematoma. I yeah. have colleagues I mean I have colleagues who've never seen a subdural hematoma. Yeah. Subdural hematoma. So some of them were really freaking out. And so my calm demeanor kept <laughs> what we need to do until we get that patient to the emergency room. Oh wow, that's interesting. If I had to rate mine, I would say stress on my job because we're pretty short now um, is probably a four, the highest one. Uh, but I'm I'm kind of like you. Um, at work, I'm, I have like I might go in the bathroom and freak out like, oh my goodness. But like coworkers would never see me do that. So I will say stress at work. Um, one of my personal distressor is to take a minute. If I start to get to where I know it's like getting to me, I, I just leave. Um, I might go like in the locker room or um, in the staff lounge, turn the light off to kind of like bring myself back. Because uh, when I was reading the part about uh, like the levels of stress and I was like, oh my God, what would happen if I actually get to that level at work where I can't, <laughs> where I can't bring myself back? Who's going to help me at work? I was like, especially if you work the weekend. But there, there is a lot of chaos at my job right now, um, and there's a lot of stress. So all the, the theories for this week kind of like merge into one for my job. Yeah, I try because I'm the charge nurse, just like you. I'm the charge yeah. nurse most of the shifts that I work. And you know what I tell my folks is that our most important priority is the patient care. Everything yeah. else that comes with our jobs can wait until the patient yeah. care is under control. Yeah. And so, you know, if you have something, you know, some report you need to do for the nurse manager, well, then, you know, that can wait <laughs> if it yeah. has to, you know, and then maybe once the patient care crisis is over or the situation is under control, we can work as a team to, 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 to do the admin stuff. Oh, that's true. So of all the theories, which one is your favorite? I know we had to do the three, the social, we had to do um, social, managerial, and behavioral. Which one was your favorite? I think the managerial was my favorite because yeah. you always want to have a, because the manager sets the tone for, for yeah. how your entire work day goes. Yeah. You know, the manager doesn't have his or her act together and is a toxic person, then the rest of the staff will follow right into that toxicity. That's true. I like the man. I like the managerial, but I think the the stressor, the stress um, theory will be my favorite because um, recently will be where I've had to test myself when it comes to how much stress I could handle and trying to find ways um, to de-stress before I get to the level four to where I can bring myself back. So I would say maybe I like the, I have a good manager, so I never think about that. And hopefully when I become a manager one day, I'm kind of like her or, or better than her because you always want to aim higher. But um, the manager one, I like that one, but I would say the stressor is learning to cope with stress learning to um even when you have co-workers that uh, you know i get into that level because we do have some that don't know how to handle stress like when you give like a one i know one nurse that uh, if you give her 18 patients she's a care partner if you give her 18 patients you pretty much have to babysit her throughout the day to make sure she's okay because she'll cry, she'll complain, I can't do this. And you're like, oh, well, you kind of just have to babysit the whole time. So I would say stre the stress theory is the one I like the most. Yeah, with her, with her, it sounds like you have to take a pretty directive approach. Oh, yeah, you can't, you cannot, like, 
you just have to keep checking on her because she'll give up on you real quick. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this has been fun. I know, I know. I know I'm I'm surprised I'm still awake, but <laughs> yeah. So we could stop the recording okay. for the theory and then we'll talk about our